Good evening. I'm Zamaven of the Eventide, and it's Vampire Chronicles time again. Come on, you know you're excited. Maybe not as excited as I am. I am a bit obsessed. So much has been going on over the past few months with AMC's and Rice's interview with the Vampire TV show. A season two has been filming in Prague since early this year, and a lot of interesting information has been creeping out through the cracks, or it was until the SAG after strike began a couple weeks ago. Season two hadn't been impacted much by the writer's strike, as all the scripts had already been completed before that hit, though that strike did keep executive producers Rollin Jones and Hannah Moscovich from being involved on set during production because they are also both writers of some of the episodes. But despite this season being shot in Europe and most of the cast not even being American at all, six of the principal actors are still members of SAG, and so production came to an abrupt halt with the SAG strike. As it should. When that happened, they already had a good amount of footage in the can. No word on exactly how much, but my guess is more than half the season, at least. So although the strike made them have to cancel their panels at San Diego Comic-Con last week, it did not stop them from releasing their very first teaser trailer for season two. Did you watch it? Do you have questions about it? Well, I am here to answer them and explain everything I can in context of the source material. So shiny. I will be using my knowledge of all the Vampire Chronicles books to break down, analyze, and speculate on this trailer. So, uh, spoilers for a 40 year old book, I guess. But that obviously very well might also mean spoilers for the TV show, especially if you haven't read the book. So, this is your warning. The trailer opens with our interviewer, Daniel Malloy, starting up his recording software and saying, Okay, so where did we leave off? Where indeed? To recap the ending of season one, last we left our angsty vampire murder family, Louis and Claudia had just killed Lestat, and finally escaped off to Europe with the hopes of finding other vampires in the world who would be less dickish than Lestat, to learn more about their kind and answers to their burning existential questions about why vampires exist and the meaning of life and so on and so forth. It's revealed at the end of the season one finale that Lestat is probably not actually dead. He's like a cockroach, there's no getting rid of him. His coffin was tossed in the dump where he'll slowly revive himself off the blood of dump rats. Louis tried to lie about this and tell Daniel that it was only because both he and Claudia couldn't bear to burn Lestat's body. But Daniel, hard-hitting interviewer that he is, saw through Louis immediately and knew it was all Louis who refused to take the final step to fully destroy Lestat. And he had to fight Claudia to keep her from doing it herself. Louis just can't quit that cockroach. But he does put an ocean between them and hopefully that'll do for now. This is different from the book because here, when he goes to Europe, he really does think Lestat is dead, though it's much less his fault in here than it is in the show. Of course Lestat can't be dead. He's the best character in the whole thing. In the book, he disappears for the entire second half, except for popping up two tiny times toward the end. But in the TV show, we can't have one of our top build actors only appear for a couple scenes in the entire second season. So. We have all been wondering just how Sam Reed as Lestat is going to be getting his screen time in season two. And thanks to some leaks from production, we have some answers on that. So this is your warning for possible spoilers on that front as well. For instance, one of the actors shared this photo online that shows Sam Reed wearing the same vest that he wore in the scene where he made Louis a vampire in the first episode of season one. So if we're getting like a retelling or extended version of that scene, we might also be getting more season one repeat stuff as well. Though considering the New Orleans sets they use for the first season have all been struck, I'm thinking that the might be like small flashes of scenes, but there will also be new Lestat scenes beyond that, which we will get back to him. 
as Daniel, who, oh, by the way, the fans have dubbed Old Manuel, as this version of Daniel doesn't become a vampire when he was 32, but has lived a successful and full mortal life instead. As he preps for a new night of interviewing, we see that the vampire Armand has joined him and Louis at the table. It was not only revealed at the end of the season one finale that Louis' assistant Rashid was secretly major Vampire Chronicles character Armand all along. We so called it, just like even based off Rashid's casting call before the show even dropped, I knew it. But also in this version of the story, Louis and Armand are still a couple in the modern era. In the book, Louis and Armand break up after many years of a stagnant, loveless relationship before Louis ever even does the first interview in 1973. So the fact that he is so epically alone at that time is a big part of why he even does that interview at all. In this version, not only is Louis still with Armand at that time, but they were apparently in an active relationship. And therefore, Louis just did the whole 1970 interview for shits and giggles, I guess, not existential morass. And on top of that, they are also still a couple 40 years later for the show's new second interview, to the point where Louis calls him the love of my life which as you'll recall from the last time we talked is a huge change from the book as their relationship was never happy and loving. Just two miserable souls trapped together, wandering emptily through a semblance of life for decades until Armand finally gives up on Louis ever being interesting again and leaves him. So now Armand is going to be joining in on the interview, it seems. Wow wearing white for the first time after his all black ensembles of the first season. Him joining is a practical choice on the show's part as the story is about to shift to the part where he and Louis meet for the first time. So we'll be able to hear parts of that story from his point of view, similar to how season one gave us parts from Claudia's point of view in the form of her diaries. And this is how Lestat is going to get his screen time. With Armand telling his side of the story now, it is a perfect excuse for him to also tell parts of his backstory from when he knew brand new baby vampire Lestat in the 1700s. Yes, 18th century flashback scenes. Even though we don't see any of this in the trailer, this is more than just a speculation on my part. It was confirmed when we saw some casting notices released over the past couple months for extras needed for an audience for the Teatro de Vampire in the year of its 18th century origins, as well as the reveal that came out a few weeks ago that actor Joseph Potter is playing the part of Nicola, who Lestat tells us in season one died a hundred years before he met Louis. Also, after the trailer dropped, Entertainment Weekly ran exclusive production photos that added this shot of Lestat in 1700s clothes, complete with a red cloak that looks like it has a wolf fur trim. A nod to his famous cloak in the book, though in the book that one was completely lined in wolf fur. Like, not just a trim, like head to toe. Wolf. It's a very hairy cloak. In this photo, we're seeing him through glass beside a carriage window curtain. Perhaps the same carriage that we saw in the photos of the extras on set for the theater scenes in the 1700s? So more support for my suspicion that Armand will be the one telling these flashback scenes as he sees Lestat roll by in a carriage. There's no scene like that in the book, but we do know Armand was spying on Lestat for some time before ever revealing his sewer gremlin self and trying to convince Lestat to join his satanic cult. And I am excited to see those missing scenes fleshed out on the screen. All of Armand and Lestat's history together is told in book two of the Chronicles, The Vampire Lestat. Previously, Roland Jones told us that the Vampire Lestat would be the subject of season three if the show got renewed again. So we all thought we would have to wait a whole nother year before we saw any of these scenes of Lestat's backstory with Armand and Nicola. But now we'll be getting it at least some of it in season two. Very exciting. Now, I have seen some fans think this photo is of Lestat as a human because it doesn't look like Sam Reed here is wearing his vampire contacts, but the lighting is off in 
I don't think so. First of all, his clothes are very fine and expensive looking, which Lestat could never afford as a human before his vampire maker Magnus gave him a treasure chest full of gold, and he certainly couldn't afford fancy carriage rides. Secondly, if this is from Armand's point of view in the book, Armand doesn't even know Lestat exists until after he's a vampire, and he's running around Paris breaking all of Armand's satanic cult vampire rules. And at this point in the book, Armand kidnaps and tortures the mortal boyfriend that Lestat had to leave behind when he became a creature of the night, thereby forcing Lestat to make Nicolette into a vampire, even though he never wanted to damn him to such a horrible existence. So, unless the show is making major changes to Armand's story, I don't think we'll be seeing human Lista at all in season two. Human Nikki, perhaps, if we get some before Armand kidnaps him bits, but not human Lista. Yes, Armand here is looking smooth and sure of himself, ready to join in on this interview. But Louis, across the table, is looking cowed and upset, his shoulders hunched, his brow furrowed, his eyes sad. They are wearing new outfits, but I don't think this is more than a day after we last left them. And Louis is still grappling with the truth Daniel forced him to acknowledge at the end of season one, that he was never strong enough to fully quit the stunt. It's not weakness. And there's no such thing as the vampire bond, okay? They are soulmates, and we all know it. So yes, all three of them are at the table now, and it looks like Daniel rejects some orange juice or whatever he's been offered, probably in a rude and smarmy way, because he's just that kind of jerk in this version. He's a hard-hitting reporter now. He doesn't have time for juice. Also, apparently Louis' house staff isn't masking anymore. Isn't Daniel still immunocompromised? Yes, things are better now in 2023. Finally. But this scene is supposed to be immediately after where we left them in season one. Why would they change their masking policy overnight? Anyway, we cut to the streets of Paris, 1946. We know it's 1946 because Claudia's diary entry in season one told us that although they left New Orleans for Europe in 1940, they did not actually get to Paris until six years later. In the book, it took them 10 years, but everything in the show is condensed, of course, for the modernized timeline. The opening shots of the Paris streets with the car here mirror the season one trailer with the streets of Storyville in 1910. And once again, we are seeing a world of joie de vivre, ripe for rambunctious vampire shenanigans. Armand's voice tells us Paris is an awakening for Louis. Paris was an awakening for Louis. He's been in his depressed post-husband murder slump for six years, but now he is ready to get on with living again. And Louis parallels this to how the whole world is ready to return to getting back to the high life after the terrible years of World War II. The whole world was ready to return. This, of course, is not actually Paris you are seeing, but Prague, dressed up as Paris. I guess Paris was too expensive of a place for them to film. There are supposedly plans to do some filming in actual Paris, at least if the strike ends in time for the rest of the show to actually finish being made. But for the most part, Prague stands in for all the Paris scenes you'll see. As Louis and Claudia walk through the streets, we see he's pensive and she is all starry-eyed. This is because they are on their way to the Theater of the Vampires, which is a grotesque variety show of creepy performance art put on by real vampires right in the middle of Paris that the human population thinks is just a group of intense method actors. If the show follows the book here, then Louis has recently met the vampire Santiago, the first real vampire that he's encountered after years of searching all over Europe for his fellow beings. Santiago attacks him, and then Louis is rescued by Armand, who invites him to the theater as a guest to meet the coven. Claudia is excited to finally meet these new vampires, but Louis is wary after Santiago's attack, and Armand's general creepiness. He's got bad vibes from them already, and with good reason. Meanwhile, Claudia, who's always been a far creepier vampire than Louis was anyway, she's into it. And next, we cut to a scene that either has to be later that same night or another night entirely. Here, we get our first glimpse of Santiago himself. Instead of being young and beautiful with rippling black hair like he is in the book, he is now played by veteran British theater and film actor Ben Daniels, sporting a bleach blonde dye job that instantly reminds us of Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or more aptly, David from The Lost Boys. 
as we see now, that not only are the theater a coven of vampire thespians, but also a biker gang on classic 1940s Vespas. There is a vampire biker gang in the books, the Fang Gang, in 1985, and we met a very altered version of their leader, Killer, last season, but now Santiago and friends are in on it too. Motorbikes for everyone! Unlike in the book where Armand keeps distant from the activities of the other vampires, serving as their unofficial leader, as the oldest vampire in the coven, but generally not at all interested in socializing with them, we see that here he is also part of this biker gang with some nifty little glasses. This would either be the vampire Celeste or Estelle, one of the only two other named vampires in the coven. And these are a couple of the unnamed rest, which looks to be about a dozen from the other shots we see, possibly 13 exactly, because that seems like the kind of nerdy thing the show would do. And now that we're in Europe, we're seeing even more diversity in the show's casting with some black and Asian vampires included. The biker gang revs up to this mansion, a location just outside of Prague called Zamek Slapi or Slappy Castle, which according to the extra casting calls we saw, we know is used for an extravagant party scene in the first half of the season. If that is what the vampires are coming here for now, though, it looks like the party hasn't gotten started yet, and they are not at all dressed up for it. Show some class. You guys couldn't have even put on, like, fancy hats or anything. Lestat went all out for his masquerade ball in season one. We can't see if Louis is here in these motorcycle shots, but considering he's the one telling the story and it is a story about him, my guess is that he's there somewhere in the background because we do know that he does end up joining their biker gang at some point as during exterior filming in Prague, they did nothing to keep tourists from seeing and taking photos of the set and actors while they were testing their bikes. While most of the bikes are black, Armand has this pretty red bike, which might be the show's a nod to his singularly famous auburn hair in the book. All the theater vampires in the book dye their hair black because they're just so goth like that. So Armand stands out as the only one with color to his hair. Here, since they changed Armand's heritage and ethnicity for the show, the actor naturally has black hair and they have him only ever dressed in black, white, or brown. So they had to get that reddish color in there somewhere. I'm probably putting much more thought into this than the show actually did. Next, we cut to a scene that is nights or perhaps even weeks after Claudia and Louis first attend the theater as we see Claudia is wearing a costume from the theater. We'll get back to that. This is Madeline, played by Roxanne Duran, a human who Claudia develops a relationship with. In the book, Madeline is a Parisian doll maker who blows Claudia's mind by making dolls that look like little adult ladies instead of just baby dolls, which was all she'd ever known before. Madeline lost a little daughter, so she's instantly drawn to Claudia as a replacement daughter who will never die like hers did. Claudia tells her what she is, and Madeline wants to become a vampire too, so that they can be together forever. This is ideal for Claudia because at this point in the story, she knows Louis kind of wants to dump her for Armand, some, something he would never actually let himself do. So she finds someone to be her new vampire parent to let him off the hook so he can go be happy with his new boyfriend without having to navigate the intense bitterness that has grown between himself and Claudia since Lestat died. Like every relationship in the Vampire Chronicles, Claudia and Madeline's blurs the line between parent-child and romantic in a most gothic way. Age gaps and dark and sesty stuff are basic tropes of gothic fiction, but we do know that the show has been trying to avoid stuff in that arena. Despite how all vampires in Anne Rice's books are naturally bi and transcend gender, in season one, the show did make Claudia aggressively straight, only ever interested in and noticing boys and men. Boy from Pontetula, boy from Hollow Grove, boy with the bow tie out in Algiers. For them to suddenly have her now in a sapphic relationship in season two would be an abrupt change to her characterization here. It's almost like when they were writing season one, they kind of forgot the Madeline relationship was coming up and short-sightedly undermined any possible foundations for it. 
the show going the romantic route with Madeline would also undermine the point they made in season one about how the only relationships Claudia could have with adults her mental age would mean that the adults would have to be perverts attracted to little girls, which to her was repulsive. To avoid this, the show might have aged Madeline down, but we see here she is a mature, even matronly adult. So this leads me to suspect that there might not actually be any romantic element to her relationship with Claudia this time. So what will it be? Just mother-daughter? A mentor figure? I am very intrigued how the show will have Claudia feel that kind of connection to a white woman considering how bitter she was toward her white father in season one for specifically racial dynamic reasons. What circumstances could make Claudia now comfortable in a daughterly or mentee role to a white woman? So many questions! As there is no indication that Madeline is still a doll maker, and why should there be? Always dolls are used as symbols and imagery in the book have been removed from the show. I am very curious to see who Madeline is now, what she does, what her whole deal is, and why Claudia is drawn to her this time. We see later in the trailer Madeline sitting in the audience of the theater and Claudia wearing this costume on stage. And if Madeline came to the show to see Claudia perform in this costume, this clip seems to be them meeting just outside the theater where the gang parks their bikes. I'm guessing right after the show as it looks like she has a theater program tucked under her arm. So either Madeline coming to see the show and seeing Claudia on stage is the first time they meet and something compels Claudia to go out and meet her after the show, or they are already friends and Madeline just comes to see one of Claudia's shows, like the supportive wannabe vampire bestie she is. Look how happy they are to see each other, knowing they're going to have such a long and happy future together. <laughs> yeah, that's not what happens. <laughs> to remake their lives. We get a shot of Louis clinking a glass with someone. We can't fully tell from his clothes and hair if this is modern Louis in Dubai or 1946 Louis in Europe. He's not wearing black, and he does seem to only ever wear black in modern times, but his hair is poofy, like in the interview scenes, and he seems to always keep it slicked down in the 1946 scenes. The corked bottle behind them looks old-fashioned, and the hand holding the other glass is holding an old-timey looking cigarette, and it looks like the hand of a white man. Santiago, perhaps? What would they have to clink about? And Louis looks, well, not happy, but fine? A little bit hopeful? Can't imagine him feeling this chill with Santiago. Of course, with the lighting, it could be a light brown hand that looks deceptively pink here. And we know that Armand is a cigarette smoker, just like Louis is. But if there are vampire fingernails on that hand, I can't see them at all. And Louis's fingernails are so obvious here. Daniel doesn't smoke, as far as we know, so it can't be him, but someone else in modern day Dubai? We do know from a couple photographs that production shared online a few months ago before quickly realizing they might be kind of spoilery and pulling them off the internet, asking us not to share them anymore, that they were developing concepts for a scene set in a Dubai sushi restaurant. So maybe modern big haired Louie meets someone for a fishy dinner at some point and they strike some kind of deal. My guess is that this scene is from earlier in the 1940s, before Louis even gets to Paris and has his awakening and starts doing his hair again. During the first six years after they leave New Orleans, Louis and Claudia roam dark and mysterious Eastern Europe, looking for the vampires Claudia read about in all those Dracula-type mythology books she had. And at one remote village in a spooky Transylvania-type place, they finally find something. It happens when they stop at an inn where an Englishman is being detained by the local peasants because they think his recently dead wife is going to rise as a vampire because she was supposedly attacked by one. This guy, whose name is Mr. Morgan, latches onto Louis because he's the only one there who could speak English, begging him not to let the peasants desecrate his wife's body. And Louis learns all about the zombie-like creature that's been terrorizing their village. He gets the information out of Morgan and the villagers, and he and Claudia go off to find this thing for themselves, hoping it's finally another one of their kind that they can bond with. Turns out this particular vampire's mind is destroyed, so it's not even really a person anymore. Just a revenant. 
basically a zombie. So Louis kills it like a good old fashioned a vampire slayer and he and Claudia just barely make it back to the inn in time before sunrise. You know this scene is still in the show as one of the leaked audition scripts for season one, back before the story was split into two seasons, they were gonna tell the whole thing in season one. It was a scene where Louis and Claudia had just escaped this creature and were desperately seeking shelter before sunrise. This scene obviously wasn't included in season one along with a couple other scripts I read back then, but I always suspected it was being saved for season two. They might have cut it out entirely like they did with the scene of young Claudia stealing a car and getting caught joyriding by Tom Anderson but even if that particular scene doesn't end up in the show the way I read it, we do know the scene with Morgan is in the show because a picture of the production room shared by the crew a few months ago showed some actor headshots on the wall with character names and there's Morgan right there, except they changed Morgan to his first name now, so he's Morgan Ward. If this rumpled looking Louie is in a remote village tavern with that old timey vodka bottle, that could be Morgan's glass he's clinking as he makes his offer to go out and find the thing that killed his wife. But he was a hunger. Next, we see Claudia walking away from the motorcycles with her fangs extended, about to go attack some next rabid murder queen that she is. Louis, behind her, turns to focus on what looks like Armand, though it is hard to tell. With the motorcycles and the trees and the blurry building in the background, my guess is that this scene is at Sloppy Castle, and they're all there to get some dinner. Now, them making a gory vampire murder scene at an extravagant ball would be extremely different from how the coven operates in the book, where the vampires are all very clever about hiding their kills and their existence from society and covering up their tracks. But we do know this show likes its splashy gore. Here, we see Claudia in an all black outfit, so different night, in the theater dressing room, biting Santiago's wrist while surrounded by the theater vampires all in their stage makeup. It looks like some kind of initiation ceremony with the other vampires soon joining in all drinking from each other. But don't you do family bonding, wrist biting orgy time at home? And considering she is later acting on stage with them, it seems like in this version, she officially joins the theater of the vampires coven and becomes an actor with them. She doesn't do this in the book at all. She very much looks down on the Paris vampires as soon as she meets them, finding their whole theater shtick shallow and boring and meaningless. This is similar though to the Broadway musical version of the story where both she and Louis do join the theater of the vampires and act on stage in their plays. This time though, it looks like it's just her. We see neither Louis nor Armand taking part in this bloody brotherhood ceremony. And the next cut is to them, alone together on a date in an outdoor Paris cafe, making intrigued eyes at each other, both smoking up a storm, because isn't it so sexy when people smoke? That's how you know they want each other. My guess is uh, this is the start of their relationship, that they bond over being different from the other vampires while Claudia is busy becoming one with them. And instead of having their first deep philosophical soul connecting conversation in Armand's basement room covered in devil paintings, they go out for some ooh la la on the Perry Boulevard. Then we get our first looks at an actual performance of the Theater of the Vampires. We are back to that first night with Claudia in the purple dress with the cape lit when she and Louis attend the theater for the first time before actually meeting the coven. I love these skull carrying death angels they've got flanking the stage here. I need one for my lair. Like in the book, Santiago is the master of ceremonies, and we see that the vampires are also playing the instruments for the show's music, which is nice to see. Vampire music was an important element to the theater in the book, but it wasn't included in the movie very much, though the rest of what we see in the vampire play is very similar to the movie scenes. This is when the trailer shows us that shot of Madeline in the audience. I'm pretty sure this isn't from the night Louis and Claudia are there for the first time. Neither she nor these people around here are visible in the wide shot of the extremely tiny and sparse audience where we see Louis and Claudia. But these groupies are. Look at them with their face paint and wigs like they're here for a midnight viewing of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. 
not too far off since AMC pointedly modeled its version of the theater off of Paris's historical Grand Mignol Theater, something that was not in any way connected to Anne Rice's ideas for the theater, as Grand Mignol didn't exist until 1897 and the vampire theater in the book burns down in 1871, even though the show's theater was still established in the 1700s like it is in the book, and they had a hundred years of vampire shenanigans there. I guess now, at some point after 1897, the vampires decided to rip off the Grand Mignol down the street and change their theater style to a copycat of theirs. Now, where is the story about the beef that must have existed between these two theaters? That's a show I want to see. I would watch that. Madeline here is wearing black again, mother in mourning that she is. Look, she's got the little locket with her dead daughter's portrait. Claudia is looking tickled pink as she watches the show, not at all derisive like she is in the book. But Louis looks weirded out about all the grotesque shenanigans. The flashes of bits from the plays look in line with how it is in the book, Santiago playing the role of the Grim Reaper, smugly stealing the lives of unsuspecting mortals while spouting Don's macabre philosophy about how death comes for all of us, no matter our lot in life. Like I said, if you've seen the movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But instead of using, like, ribbons for blood, they've got some red wet stuff spraying out, and members of the audience sitting in the splash zone are using protective umbrellas. These front row groupies came prepared. This may be stage blood, or it could be the real thing, as it has come out recently that actor Sinead Phelps is cast in the role of the human girl that gets killed on stage during the play. That's right, it's a snuff play. This scene was also shown in the movie, pretty accurate to how it is in the book, so if you've seen that, you know who I'm talking about. The vampires have kidnapped a mortal girl and torture, molest, and kill her on stage while the whole time the audience thinks it's just part of the act. Louis knows the truth, of course, and he is both turned on and grossed out by this as he watches, and it is an important moment that depicts what a different kind of sophisticated and intellectual vampire he and Claudia are compared to these cheap, cliché Paris vampires. According to the show's a casting call for the girl, she has a name now, Anika Ruman, and she is a Dutch tourist kidnapped away from her husband and son while visiting Paris. As you can hear in a different actor's audition tape for the part that's up on YouTube depicting the scene where Santiago taunts her, it uses a lot of the same dialogue from the book, just like the movie did. Do you know what it's like to be loved by death? An unconscious death is the fate of all mortals, so why shouldn't it take you now? Unless you would trade your place with someone else, and so on. So yes, I am curious to see how the show will distinguish its version visually without being just a repeat of what the movie already did so very well. The casting call for Anika says that Santiago is the one who kills her on stage, so maybe this time Armand won't come out on stage and take over with her like he does in the book? Missed opportunity, if so. Armand is generally way too cool to ever actually perform on stage with the other dorky vampires, but the night Louis comes, he shocks everyone by interrupting the show and giving the girl a grandly sexy finish. Either way, this might be her blood we see splashing on the audience. Uh, what a waste if it is. Poor Anne Rice would be rolling her eyes. Her vampires never spill blood like that. It all goes in their bellies. Not a drop wasted. As we know, the show has decided to ignore that lore. We cut to after the show, when Louis and Claudia are invited backstage and downstairs to the dressing rooms where the vampires live and sleep in their coffins during the day. They look nervous to meet the crew, as well they should. These are very scary vampires, and at this point in the book, the coven was already suspicious that Louis and Claudia had killed their maker, thereby breaking one of the cardinal vampire rules. But here, Armand, with a much Frenchier accent than he used in season one, introduces them. Louis and Claudia. Welcome to our coven. And the undead thespians seem to happily welcome Louis and Claudia to the coven with sweeping bows. Then we get some shots of the vampire biker gang zooming through the deserted midnight streets. Armand in the lead, his brown trench coat flapping in the wind. Then cut back to the theater. Claudia has now joined the show and is acting on stage in a little girl costume. This is the only time we've seen her even looking like a little girl so far. It seems like the show has given up on trying to keep the audience reminded that even though the actor playing her is an adult, Claudia is supposed to be tortured by being trapped eternally in a 14-year-old body. We have a new actor 
playing Claudia this season due to Bailey Bass being unable to continue the role. And just like Bass, Delaney Hales is gorgeous and youthful looking despite being several years older than Claudia is supposed to be. But aside from this theater costume where it seems she's playing like a six-year-old or something, in all the other shots and promotional images we've seen, Claudia is dressed in a way where she could pass perfectly as an adult. In season one, she complained about her childish body and her flat chest, but now the costumes and posing are emphasizing curves and womanliness. In the book at this point in the story, Claudia does give up on little girl dresses and starts having adult-style dresses made in her size, though she is still unhappy that the people of Paris then assume she's a little person when they see her walking in the street. With Claudia aged up and tall as she is in the show, it seems now she can pass for a regular-sized adult with no problem. Which makes me wonder why she didn't start doing that 20 years ago? The one time we did see her try it in season one, it didn't work, and she was mocked for it by the other girls. I guess she's figured it out, and it's just fine now. When Claudia's on stage, we see the front row groupies are still here, but now the theater audience is packed, standing room only. Our first glimpse of the theater showed that it seemed to be struggling. The audience is so sparse, and it's got a couple letters out in its neon sign. What? Neon signs do not work that way? Is every single one of those tiny letters on its own transformer? Why would they do that? Neon is a tube. It's all connected. Just the A would not be out on a sign that small. Now, I know shows and movies always make this mistake with neon signs as visual shorthand for seediness, but when you spend five years working for a neon sign company, this sort of thing really bugs you. Yes, damaged signs, nearly empty audience, and Claudia joins the theater as a new attraction, and boom, ticket lines are out the door, all of Paris is buzzing about it, the show is saved. Saved from what? I'm not sure. It's not like the vampires actually need to sell tickets. They can get money from anywhere. The theater was always only meant to be a front for managing their existential crises and keeping them from falling too distant from society. I don't know. I guess that maybe they're about to lose the lease or something and Claudia arrives in the nick of time to save the family farm. Except Lestat owned that theater outright before he gave it to Armand in the 1700s. It's been paid for for 150 years. I don't know, maybe their actor egos just couldn't handle nobody coming to their shows. So they must really like her now. We cut to Louis and Armand on a park bench in the rain because would he be Louis at all if he weren't sad and wet? Although it's not as poofy as before, his hair is not done, so he must be having a bad day, and Armand is swooping in here to save his soul. My guess is he's going through the drama with Claudia and Madeline, not wanting to break up with Claudia, but knowing it would be for the best, and Armand uh, spins his web to seduce Louis to the dark side while wearing an Indiana Jones hat. Because it's the 1940s, and back then people still thought fedoras were cool. Then we jump to the night where Claudia convinces Louis to make Madeline into a vampire so that she and Madeline can be together while Louis frolics off into the moonset with the new love of his life. Look, she's not wearing black anymore. She's done grieving her daughter and ready to move on with her new girl. In the book, Louis is vehemently against the idea of ever making another vampire. He would never damn another person's soul to such an evil existence. He fights against Lestat to keep him from making Claudia, and he tells Claudia that making Madeline would kill the last part of his soul that was human. The only reason it even eventually happens is because Armand psychically manipulates him to do it. But considering season one changed it to be his idea to make Claudia a vampire, he just might be more on board with the Madeline plan this time. He looks serious here, but he's not tortured or anything. His sleeves are rolled up, ready for business. In the book, Claudia can't make other vampires herself because she's just too tiny. Not enough blood. The show told us in season one that this Claudia tried to make others, but it never worked, even though she's full-sized now. They never gave an explanation for why it didn't work, but... It has to be more than just her not knowing how to do it, right? Because she still needs Louis to do it for her here instead of just having him or one of the other theater vampires teach her. That Claudia in the show still needs and wants Madeline as her vampire companion hints that she's not actually happy with the theater vampires despite joining them via their arm orgy. If she was satisfied with them and had really found her new home that she'd been so desperately searching for, she wouldn't need Madeline at all, right? and a look at the love in their eyes for each other. So my suspicion is that her time at the theater starts out good and hopeful, but something makes her quickly become disillusioned with it and want to escape. 
perhaps something to do with them suspecting her of her crimes against Lestat? Oopsie! It looks like they're giving Madeline the dark gift in a dressmaker's or a tailor's shop. There's a mannequin in the window and bolts of fabric on the shelves, so my guess is that now, instead of being a doll maker, Madeline is an atelier, though not a very fancy one, as this shop looks pretty basic, perhaps even shut down as the mannequin in the window is naked. Maybe she lost her passion for fashion when her daughter died? We cut back to a sinister-looking Santiago, half undressed from his theater costume, still wearing the harness for his flying rope he used on stage. He's a backstage, a downstairs in the dressing room with the other vampires again, but the trailer juxtaposes this with a shot of Armand upstairs in the empty theater facing the stage. Clearly from two completely different scenes, but the cut gets the idea across of the hostility that does exist between Santiago and Armand. Even though Armand's a much more powerful and respected by the coven, Santiago doesn't love the way he leads it, and he has his own ideas of how things should be done. In the book, Santiago's hostility serves as sort of a red herring, making Louis and the reader think that he is the villain to watch out for, the one who drives the murder of Claudia and Madeline at the climax, and then the twist is that it was secretly Armand all along in his grand scheme to get Louis for himself, while also conveniently driving Louis to burn down the theater and destroy all the other vampires that he was bored with and never liked anyway. The show may be working the same angle here, but given how season one made us believe that Louis and Armand actually have a real relationship that continued into modern times completely different from their dead-inside non-relationship in the book, the show might also be using Santiago as the true villain after all, thereby leaving Armand much less guilty of hurting Louis by murdering his daughter? God, I hope not. Given the show's choices so far, I wouldn't be surprised. Though the promo poster for the two of them does copy the classic poster from the movie Gaslight. And the fact that in that Entertainment Weekly interview, Sam Reed basically warned us to give up any hope for any healthy, non-problematic relationships does give me hope that Armand will be just as diabolical as he ever was in the books. Of course, then the big question that we can't wait to see answered is how do we get from there to here? The love of my life. My guess for what Armandiana Jones is actually doing in this shot is conducting a rehearsal with Claudia for the play she's going to be in. It seems the show is making him a lot more involved in the theater, and he's the actual writer of the plays it puts on. We see on the poster of the show Louis and Claudia first come to see that the play Shrieks in the Dark was written by him. Funny story. So. When the pictures of these posters were first being shared online by all the tourists passing by the set, it said the play was written by Armand Marius. Armand is using Marius as his last name now? Marius is another one of the great characters of From the Vampire Chronicles, and he is the vampire who made Armand in Renaissance Venice, and we did hear him mention Marius in season one. It's Venetian, a contemporary of Tintoretto's. Marius de Romanus. Never heard of him though with no indication at all of how he really feels about him now. In the books, they're not close anymore, and he never uses Marius's name that way. Around 2013, he does start calling himself Armand Le Russe, which just means Armand the Russian, as he's originally from Kiev Rus. But as the show's Armand's heritage is changed, he can't use that surname, so now he's Armand Marius? Or is he? The very next day after these photos were shared, another tourist shared pictures of the same wall of posters being put up, and the word Marius had been blacked out from some of them? What is going on? Anyway, in the books, Armand does not write plays or take any part in them. He's just sort of a behind-the-scenes manager. But now, actual theatrical artiste Armand, he's got a hobby, perhaps even a passion since season one had him acting out the role of Louis's human servant Rashid for the sake of tricking Daniel for some reason. I really hope this season reveals the reason. It seems he is a true thespian after all. 
Next, we see Louis inside a long, creepy tunnel, being followed. And my guess is that this is when he first meets Santiago before Armand makes his grand entrance to rescue Louis from Santiago's attack. A meet cute that is certainly not at all orchestrated ahead of time by Armand's meticulous design. In the book, it seems that Louis finally bumps into other vampires in Paris, somewhat luckily after having been living there for a while. But we find out in the sequel, The Vampire Lestat, that the theater vampires had noticed Louis and Claudia in town, but had been avoiding them per vampire wisdom of never engaging with strangers. But after the destroyed Lestat crawls his way to Paris to find his old buddy Armand and beg him for some of the powerful blood to help heal the wounds Louis and Claudia left at him, and he tells Armand about his ungrateful fledglings, Armand is like, hmm. Not only am I going to refuse to heal Lestat, lock him up in a basement, starve and torture him, but I am also gonna go steal his husband. And then he arranges his first meeting with Louis where he can look like a hero, and Louis never finds out about any of this until modern times long after he and Armand break up. Does he know now? And he's still with him? In the show, Lestat hasn't come back and told his version of the story, the vampire Lestat, the whole rock star thing yet. So it's possible that Louis still doesn't know this, but maybe he does and he doesn't care. I really hope we get this juicy backstory in the show. Armand's obsession with Lestat directly leading to his pursuit of Louis is one of my favorite parts in the entire series. The tunnel scene cuts with Louis getting attacked by a different vampire from a much earlier scene where Louis is outside in some leaves, but the cut still conveys the danger Louis is in here from the shadow following him. This vampire is very likely that zombie revenant that Louis goes out to find from Morgan in Eastern Europe, or something similar if the show is adding more interactions of this kind with Louis and Claudia's vampire slaying adventures. In the book, he does say he sees more types of vampires like this, even though he only tells us a story of one of them. This actor looks like a woman, and the mindless vampire in the book is male. So either they gender swap the role, which sure, why not? More parts for women, yes please, or it's someone else. Why only have one zombie when you can have many? Then we see a white man with blood on his mouth and chin, so I'm assuming probably a vampire, torching what looks like it could be Sloppy Castle. It's got the palm trees and the archways, and since he's got blood all over his face, my best guess is that after the vampires have their whole murder spree at the extravagant party, they torch the mansion to cover their tracks. Subtle. Discreet. Well, I guess they are theater kids. What do we expect? You can tell he's French because he's dressed like a mime. We know the show is keeping the part of the story where Louis burns down the theater and all the vampires inside of it after Claudia's murder because when they were filming those smoky and fiery scenes on location in Prague, they did nothing to hide them from the tourists, and we got a lot of reports and photos from people looking on in those nights. So this French mime fire bomber here may be serving as some kind of a foreshadowing for the epic theater torching Louis is going to be doing later on in the season. Then we cut back to Eastern Europe again in the earlier years of the 1940s during the war while Louis and Claudia are running away from an air raid bombing. And in that audition script that I mentioned of the scene after they were attacked by the zombie vampire, the stage directions describe them seeking shelter in a bombed out building. So this sequence could be connected to that. I think we'll be seeing lots of chaos and carnage before Louis and Claudia get to clean, fancy, refined post-war Paris for the sake of showing the transition in Louis' a vampire journey and how he goes from being internally ravaged over betraying and destroying his murder husband of 30 years to being finally ready to move on with a shiny new gremlin. Then we're back in the dining room in Dubai. Louis is sitting next to Daniel now, looking very upset. The story is so hard for him to tell. Daniel is utterly unsympathetic, giving him a smarmy look because he's too much of a hard-hitting asshole journalist to care at all about Louis's feelings. This is supposed to make the audience think he's super cool. This is Rollin Jones's idea of what makes his self-insert character cool. Because Anne Rice's characters weren't masculine enough, so now we punch holes in priests' heads! 
in the final bit, we're back to Louis and Claudia's first night in the theater, meeting the coven downstairs, and she notices Lestat's portrait on the wall in the dressing room. She plays dumb and asks, Who's that handsome man on the wall? And Armand tells them, A co-founder, Lestat de Leoncourt. From Louis' expression, we can see this news hits him hard. He still has so many feelings for Lestat. But Armand here is going to help him get over that. Armand has such a grudge against Lestat for rejecting him in the 1700s that he'll do anything to steal his man. Of course, that grudge doesn't stop Armand from keeping Lestat's portrait on the wall for 150 years, but it's just... you know, so the sight of his nemesis's face can always fill him with vengeance. Not for any other reason at all. I love them so much. Calling Lestat the co-founder of the theater is a change from the books. Originally, Lestat worked at the theater as a mortal, but after he became a vampire, he had to let go of his theatrical dreams. He bought the theater and gave it to Armand and the coven to use while he went off to travel the world. He never founded the Théâtre de Vampire or had any part in it or the coven beyond giving them the idea to be vampire mummers slash thespians in the first place. Calling him the co-founder now makes it sound like perhaps he was involved in the theater for a while before skipping town, performing as a vampire just like the others. An interesting change. They needed the theater as a way to connect to humanity after just escaping hundreds of years in a satanic cult, but Lestat didn't need that at all. So. I wonder what could possibly drive him to join them in this show. Based on some images one of the crew shared online of the scenes they shot at the theater in the 1700s, we know there's at least one scene where Lassat is in there on stage. There is a scene in the book where he goes on stage as a vampire one time while the theater is still owned and operated by mortals, and he scares all his human friends, but that is long before any of the other vampires are involved. And if my suspicion is correct about all the 1700 scenes being told from Armand's point of view, then this would have to be after it becomes a vampire theater. Either that, or they've changed the story to have Armand know about Lestat while he's still human. The first option makes more sense. The setup of this dressing room has each actor's space divided by hanging curtains to make sort of stalls. They all have a mirror and all the stuff they need for their makeup and costumes, as well as their coffins. The station where Lestat's portrait is hanging has the mirror, but nothing at all on the table. There's a coffin there, so it seems someone is using the stall. Someone who needs a place to keep their coffin, but who never actually performs on stage, just writes the scripts, so doesn't need makeup and costumes, perhaps? Armand, is this your station? Do you also take his portrait to the bathroom and sleep with it on the other pillow by your face? He does. I've seen some people say they think this is supposed to be Lestat's old dressing stall, as if the coven has been saving it for him for over a century to come back and join them again. Guess that's possible. Weird that they didn't let someone else use it in the meantime and kept it as like a shrine to him, but you know, vampires are weird. The stall to the left of him is being used as storage, full of crates with no coffin. So could it be that this was Nikki's station before he died? Again, weird that they'd never use it for any other vampire, but TV shows have to convey things with a visual language like that, rather than going with what people would logically actually do in a place like this. So, could be. So angsty. Armand looks so self-assured as he tells Louis and Claudia about Lestat, and I am dying to know if the show is going to keep it so that he is well aware of just how they're connected to Lestat, and he's completely deceiving them right there into thinking he doesn't. Or if they've changed it so that he's more innocent, pursuing Louis this time just because he likes Louis for himself and not at all for any Lestat-related reasons. God, I hope not. It's so much juicier the book way. And since we are getting a several scenes of Lestat and Armand and Nikki together in the 1700s in this season, there is such great opportunity to make the most of their epically complex relationship. The trailer ends on the shot of Louis's oh no, why is my sexy dangerous murder husband haunting me everywhere I go face, and Claudia's a serious expression as she calculates how she and Louis can stay safe from these vampires finding out they slaughtered their beloved co-founder. Dun dun dun! Spoilers! She can't. There is no staying safe at all. This is going to be a season full of fire and fury, and no one is going to come out of it happy. Probably not even Daniel.
coming 2024 could mean anything. Of course, when the 2024 release date dropped months ago, we were all hoping it meant January 2024, as season one came out around Halloween time last year, and two couldn't be that much more further behind, could it? But now with the SAG after strike, they might not even get back to filming the rest of the episodes until 2024. If they even are able to do so at all, and AMC doesn't end up scrapping the whole show for financial reasons, they are losing so much money. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. We stand with SAG and all the other affiliated strikes, and here's hoping the studios do the right thing and give the actors what they need to end the strike and do it soon. There are vampires on the line now. Because I love you, I have recut the trailer, putting all the shots in my best guess at chronological show order. Enjoy! some evidence the even tied and well i'm excited although this wasn't a full trailer just a sneak peek teaser it already looks like season two will be sticking so much closer to the books than season one did but there are bound to be twists and surprises that we can't even guess like for instance even though we didn't see him in the trailer at all we know that actor luke brandon field returned to season two very early on in filming as the young 1973 version of daniel what could those flashback scenes have been about another dream sequence a Daniel backstory prologue like the way season one started? And things like, according to this sign that tourists saw on the theater exterior location, Claudia's trial for killing Lestat will be done live on stage in front of a human audience. So instead of just pushing her and Madeline out into the sun to burn to ash like in the book and movie, are they going to slaughter the two of them right there before the front row groupies with their blood splash umbrellas? And what else? What else? All right, we heard that they filmed a sex scene with Louis and Armand. And although whatever scene San Reed was wearing his season one, episode one and two vest again for was shot in Europe and all the Dubai sets were rebuilt in Prague because they switched filming to there instead of New Orleans, even for set pieces, the show supposedly will still be returning to New Orleans at some point to shoot something. More flashbacks of Louis remembering different things about his life with Lestat? Or perhaps we will get to see something about what Lestat's up to there while he's recovering from his injuries before he follows Louis to Paris? In the books, he spent those years with Antoine, but since Antoinette was killed off in the show, what is he doing during that time instead? And whose point of view would we be hearing that story from? Episode writer and executive producer Hannah Moscovich promised on Twitter that season two was gonna break us. What does that mean? Everyone already knows how tragically Claudia dies and Louis following a fiery rampage. So what could be more heartbreaking than that? How different are they going to make Louis and Lestat's reunion when they finally meet again in 1946 Paris? And will they completely change what happens to Lestat afterwards? Please tell me Armand is still gonna throw him off the roof. So yeah, subscribe to my channel if you'd like to keep up with me as I will continue to break down and analyze more news coming out about this show whenever it does strike pending. 
And please, if you can, join my Patreon if you'd like to help me make these videos. My patrons do get to watch my videos privately before they go out public on YouTube, so you would be the first to hear all the vampire news, rumors, and speculations. Until then, keep your portrait of your nemesis close to your heart and kiss it every night before you go to sleep, because you know our mantras.